I'd like to respond to some comments by David Preston, and he is a mid-Acts hyperdispensationalist who believes Paul preached a different gospel than the 12 apostles and Jesus. And he did a debate on this, and I did a short video on some of his comments from that debate, and he responded in the comments section, and I responded to the first comment in brief. I just told him on the second comment, though, that I'm going to make a video. Because I don't like to type much, but so here we go. Let's, let's look at his comments. Now, so context, he has a misunderstanding of Acts 21 and James. James, he thinks, still believes Jews need to keep the law of Moses, even in Acts 21, when it's clearly in case that he didn't believe that in earlier chapters. Uh, and he believes he's telling Paul in Acts 21 that he needs to keep it and show everybody that he believes in keeping the law of Moses. Well, actually what's happening is not that either one of them think it's necessary, but it is a reality that keeping it is okay, especially because the Jews were already doing that, and God wasn't all that concerned that they just stop. I mean, it's okay to rest on the Sabbath. It's okay to circumcise your children. So Paul didn't go around Jewish communities telling Jews to stop doing it. And James tells him, there's a lot of Jews around here, and they're gonna, they've heard that you, you're telling Jews to stop keeping law. So go ahead and keep it with some of the brothers here. And that's what Paul did. And I showed how that's consistent with Paul's teaching elsewhere, like in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul did not tell Jews that they had to stop keeping it. He did make it clear, especially to the Gentiles, which includes Jews among them, that it wasn't necessary. And he did tell Gentiles not to start. Because the only reason they would start is because they were being told it was necessary. All right, but here's what he says. The question at hand is, did Paul tell the Jews who were among the believing Gentiles to forsake the law of Moses? The answer is yes. No scripture provided. And I'll just give you a hint, he doesn't provide one. Uh, because he didn't. Uh, Paul didn't, that is. It's interesting that Luke only corrects half of Acts 21 and 28. In verse 29... The law of Moses was the yoke of bondage, by the way. Yes, but resting on the Sabbath and keeping these ceremonial things, well, and especially the moral parts of the law, well, that was okay, though. Paul was warned by the Holy Ghost that he should not go to Jerusalem. As a result, he was almost killed. God saved him, thankfully. Paul did, did it out of love for his nation. Okay, that's irrelevant to any of the points I was making. I don't... Uh, it's irrelevant. But in regards to Acts 15.11, I addressed that very clearly in the debate. Sadly, though, you are quoting from the John MacArthur version, which is a woke leftist perversion. Peter James the less, James of Zebedee, and John all taught salvation was by faith and works, and part of that was keeping the law of Moses. The early church fathers, to the best of my knowledge, all taught that salvation was by faith, but maintained and secured by works. For over 2,000 years, Paul has been accused of having taught the Jews to forsake the law of Moses. Why? Because he did. All right, well, let me just read to you my reply. So, uh, and some other guy replied, but I said, I don't typically make big comments. Okay. I'll probably make a video, which I did. I don't want to get to it here. LS. Okay, the Legacy Standard Bible is one of the best translations out there in light of my study of Greek and the translation itself. So there's my Bible opinion versus yours. Glad we settled that. Uh, of course, it's never settled for a King James only. You said Paul did tell Jews among Gentiles to forsake the law of Moses. That's what David did. But we already know you believe that. Yeah, he stated that in that comment I just read, but we already know that. He believes it. I don't and won't until you prove it. And no, they didn't teach salvation by works. And Paul also has been accused, okay, because he said, well, Paul has been accused of uh, telling the Jews to forsake the law of Moses. And why, did, why has he been accused of that? Well, you know, uh, clearly in Paul's teaching, Paul did make it clear, especially in his epistles to Gentiles, which is, which, is, uh, which is all of the epistles, that is. But in his work in Acts, you could see that he doesn't make that a big issue of the Jews stopping these traditions. So he clearly believed the law of Moses was unnecessary and that it didn't profit as far as salvation or justification. 
Uh, it did have its benefit and its profit, but not for being saved. And that the Gentiles certainly should not start it, because that was significant. But he never said that, they sh- that the Jews need to stop. That would work itself out in time anyway, especially once AD 70 came along. But, but anyway, what he does say in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul that is, is that to those who are under the law, I became under the law. He's talking about forsaking his liberties. His liberties is he doesn't have to keep the law of Moses. That's obviously the point. But when he was with Jews and Jewish communities, this would be especially there because everybody in the community would be doing it. He behaved as though under the law because for the same reason, if I went to uh, Israel today and was evangelizing, I would rest on the Sabbath because if I'm out there working, it's going to be a problem and it's going to be hard to reach them. And I would observe their kosher uh, regulations. And that's what Paul did. To those who were under the law, he lived as though under the law. And then he says, though not under the law myself. And so that's what he's doing in Acts 21. That's very clear. Um, He said, read Romans and Galatians. Paul told the Jews among the Gentile believers that they didn't need to be circumcised. All right. And now you see down here, I just say you shifted the issue. And he did shift the issue. No, I wasn't talking about whether they need uh, to keep it or not. I, I've already made that clear. But when he says, Paul told the Jews among the Gentile believers that they didn't need to be circumcised, yeah, it's obviously that they're going to get that message because he's telling the Gentiles. And it clearly was more important to make it clear when people thought it was necessary that he said, no, it's not. And obviously the Jews among them are going to hear the message. Those Jews in the Christian churches that he's writing to are going to hear that. But that's not what we're talking about. He shifts the issue. The issue is, did he tell Jews to stop? And he obviously didn't. You can't find a passage where he did that. I mean, I'm not aware of one. Uh, He was clear. Now, you know, the interesting thing in Acts 15, when he goes to Jerusalem, he makes sure not to have Titus circumcised. May not a Jew, but the point is this. When the very issue at stake was whether the law of Moses was necessary for the Gentiles, he made sure that Titus didn't observe it for that point. But when he takes Timothy at some other time to Jerusalem, he does have him circumcised so that that doesn't become an issue among the unbelieving Jews. But, so he shifts the issue. Paul told the Jews among the Gentiles they didn't need to be circumcised. Well, they obviously are going to get that message because they're there with the Gentiles reading the same letters and hearing Paul teach if he's there. But that's not what we were talking about, David. He says that is a fact. Paul was writing to Jews in all of his epistles. He had Jews in his audience, but they were primary to the Gentiles. And he never says, you Jews are to stop. And, for example, in Galatians 5, when he tells them, if you seek to be circumcised, well, a Jew is not going to be seeking to be circumcised. Only a Gentile would do that, because a Jew would have already done that. Uh, then the Christ is not profited. And if you're going to keep the law, you've got to keep all of the law. And so... You go back to chapter 4 in the whole epistle, you see he's talking to Gentiles. He talks about them formerly being pagans. So he made it clear what the truth of the matter is, but but he didn't say you need to stop. He did say, if you think this justifies you, when that was the issue there, just in his epistles, as he says, it does not. Now, he goes on. Do you believe the early church fathers taught salvation by faith and works? I'm not all that familiar with what every church father has written on the issue. Uh, I have read some of what they say. I don't think you, David, I don't think you understand uh, what Paul teaches about salvation and faith and works and grace and all that. I don't think you understand that at all. Uh, But I don't really want to get into that issue here. He says, if that is uh, what you think about, and now he's responding to, what I thought about the Legacy Standard Bible. I said, I think it's the best out there. He said, if that is what you think about the MacArthur perversion, then you don't believe we have a perfect word of God. 
we could hold in our hand today. You have no solid foundation. This is the typical stuff King James only is say. Uh, that's your opinion, David, and I frankly don't care about what your opinion is. You could, you could, if you don't like my translation, fine. I'm okay with it because I've looked at the languages. I'm familiar with the Greek. I'm familiar with the, the translation before I got it. I studied their methods and what they did, and I've looked through it, and I'm okay with it. I think it's a good translation. I don't care if you disagree. Uh, I think you're as wrong as you can be. Uh, it's not a McMartha perversion. See, you just say that because you arbitrarily hold a particular version, the King James in this case, uh, as the standard. But I don't. That's yours. That's not my standard. That's your standard. Now, he says, then you don't believe we have a perfect word of God we could hold in our hand today. I think the Legacy Standard Bible is one of the best that you can hold in your hand today. I certainly don't, I don't think the King James is all that terrible, but I think it has several things I don't like about it. Uh, there's no perfect translation, okay? When you keep talking about the Word of God, we are talking about the medium of bringing God's Word into a particular language, a translation. And so when you talk about not having a perfect translation, there is no perfect translation. But there are plenty of translations that are, uh, are very good and reliable, and for the most part are as accurate as they need to be f for a Christian to serve Christ and be saved. Uh, well, I mean, what do you want? A translation that uh, is as perfect as inspiration's original writing? So here's the problem. You seem to think, this is what I would talk to you about, uh, let me say it like this, I don't believe in a perfect translation. I believe in great translations and decent translations, and I think there are trash translations. Uh, but what is this idea of a perfect translation? One that communicates and translates every Greek word and phrase and Hebrew word and phrase uh, as best as it could be? Okay, well, I think there are some that get pretty close, but see, here's the issue. You seem to think, seems to me anyway, that a Christian needs to know absolutely everything in the Bible flawlessly. I think, see, here's the thing. I think we should know as much as we can know. But the reality is no individual Christian knows everything and could know everything, could even remember if he did learn everything, every truth taught explicitly and implicitly in the Bible. Um... I mean, you, it'd be hard enough to memorize every word of the Bible, even if you did, to always hold every truth is one thing. And then also understanding it. I don't think serving Christ and being a Christian is based upon a precise uh, and perfect knowledge. And throughout history, most Christians had a hard time uh, even having a harder time getting even to the Bible as we do. Not every Christian owned a Bible. Many were illiterate. Uh, in the very first centuries, especially the first, they didn't even have the whole of the New Testament in their hands anyway. So a precise and full, absolutely full knowledge of God's Word evidently does not make one a Christian. And even as much as we all know, the idea that we are flawless in our understanding of all the things we believe is, uh, is arrogance. So I'm, I'm very aware that I could be wrong about something, uh, and I don't know what it is. If I'm confident on it, I obviously don't think I am wrong. But the, the fact is, I don't need a perfect Bible, and I'm using your definition. I believe God has given me exactly what I need. He's given, he's given us several very good and reliable Bibles. And if you think that having a flawless translation, you know, that'd be great. It'd be great to have a flawless. I mean, and, and many of the flaws are up to human opinion anyway. Uh, there are some things, even in the Legacy Standard, that I, I think they could have said it in a different way and even been better. But it's still good what they got. So a lot of this is opinion. And this is your opinion. You have a preferred translation. I don't care. That's your preferred translation. And you can criticize my translation. Uh, just like I can criticize the New World Translation. Uh, but in the end, you have your opinion, and I have my opinion. And yes, there is something to be said about facts. 
we can go into the facts. And I, King James only us, I don't think have a lot of facts that you rely on a lot of circular reasoning, a lot of, uh, a lot of arbitrary standards. So if you want to judge every translation by, see, that's the problem. And cause I talked about criticizing the new world translation. That's the Jehovah's witness Bible. You know, here's the difference. You arbitrarily pick a translation, the King James Version, and then you judge everything by it. Well, but God didn't write in English originally anyway. What I do is I judge by the original languages. And so, see, I'm in a much better position because I even hold the King James to that standard. So, anyway, this is, this is the typical stuff you hear from King James only, and frankly, I do not care. You use, if you, I think the King James is a reliable one, and so use it. And if you want to keep criticizing mine, yeah, you can do that too. He said, you have no solid foundation. Well, I got the word of God. I mean, you say I have no solid foundation because you have picked arbitrarily a translation standard. But I don't have to use your standard. I mean, you're not God. I don't have to use your standard. Uh, I pick a translation that I think best represents the original languages. Because I'm using the original languages as a standard, which is much more consistent and a much better foundation than you got. Because the manuscripts, the copies of the original uh, writings, are how we get the translation. How did you get the King James well, the King James wouldn't exist without the manuscripts and the original languages, the copies. And so, I'm actually using the very thing from whence came the King James. I'm in a much better, on a much better and more solid foundation than you are, my friend. Uh, but I don't really, that's not an issue I care all about right now. But the fact is, you still haven't shown me where Paul goes around teaching people to deny to Jews to stop observing the law of Moses. And I just and I'm gonna show you again in 1 Corinthians 9. Very consistent with Paul's behavior in Acts 21. And I'll use your uh, your preferred human standard, I use the King James. No, not the Apocrypha. There we go. Okay. In verse 19, he says, For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews, I became a Jew. Well, isn't that exactly what he's doing in Acts 21? Yes, it is. Now, you criticize Paul, you criticize James and Peter, and this is typical of mid-Acts. I hear them criticizing James and call him a Judaizing teacher, which there's no evidence that he is. But... You're in a bad spot. Paul's actually very consistent with himself, and so is James. For though I be free from all men, okay, he says, to the Jews I became a Jew. Actually, let me uh, pull this over here. To the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. That's what the issue is in Acts 21. They lived in a community where there were a lot of Jews that had heard what Paul was doing was telling everybody to stop obeying the law of Moses. Well, since it wasn't necessary to stop, uh, James wanted Paul to keep uh, certain aspects of the law of Moses here to demonstrate that he's not against keeping the law of Moses. That's exactly what they're talking about. That's what the issue is here. So that there wouldn't be this unnecessary hindrance in evangelizing in this Jewish society. He says, to them that are without law, as without law. See, that's with Gentiles. And so this is, this is very consistent with his met method. And so uh, you don't understand. You have a misunderstanding, as mid-Acts commonly do. Hey, listen, David. We all have some misunderstandings. I know that I do somewhere, and one day I'll probably see those as well. Hey, you even think that this is a misunderstanding. Well, we can keep talking about it, and by the grace of God, if I'm in, 
error, I believe he'll help me see it. But, look, it's consistent. I, you haven't convinced me yet, and no mid acts has. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that you won't, because I'm reading it pretty clearly. I've given you guys the opportunity. I've asked you guys several times. See, I've had conversations with you guys, and uh, it always falls apart in your theology. Um, so I've told Donnie to extend to you an invitation to debate the very topic you were debating. And so that's, uh, that's up to you. Uh, you may not want to. That's okay. But uh, I did hear from another that you were willing to. That's why I've extended the debate. So we'll see what happens. All right. So let me see if there was anything in the first comment that I wanted to touch on. He says, he says the law of Moses was a yoke of bondage. You know, the interesting thing is, and this is important, neither Peter nor James believed you need to keep the law of Moses. So you guys are just blatantly contradicting what they themselves say about themselves. And I've already talked to you about the Acts 15 issue. But Paul, and um, Peter, that is, has already, he agrees with Peter. Um, he agrees with Paul, that is. Acts 11 shows that they understand you don't need to be a Jew to be saved. And, and they don't say in Acts 11, by the way, that, well, they don't, but we do. They don't say that, right? And it's what it says is, let me find what I read already. Peter rose up. Here and said unto the men and brethren, you know, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe the gospel. Now, what gospel was that? He, I thought Peter only preached his gospel to the Jews, but it's the gospel. And now, isn't that interesting? <clears throat> How, uh, let's see, that, I, that they should uh, hear the word of the gospel and, see right over here, right here, the gospel. So, Gentiles, God appointed G uh, Peter to preach the gospel and it's two Gentiles. Now, I know you have some understanding that he started to do it wrong. He preached to them the wrong one, and then God interrupted with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, well, no. Well, either way, I don't, I don't believe that for a second. Again, mid-Acts always think that, they're, that they know better than the apostles in these places. Uh, but, so, what is important for our discussion here is that God did choose, I'm trying to find my words, God did choose Peter to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So, it's actually Peter preaching to Gentiles. And even if you believe that the one Peter start, uh, tried to preach was the wrong one and God had interrupt him, it's still the case that God wanted him to preach the gospel, which is what you would say is the gospel of the uncircumcision. You notice that? But, of course, these distinctions don't exist in the Scripture. But it says, uh, The gospel and believe, and God which, knows the, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now, you said that God had to interrupt Peter in your debate because Peter was preaching the wrong one. But yet, no, actually, he's saying, God sent me to preach the gospel and... He gave them the Holy Ghost as a witness. He didn't say, because I was preaching the wrong one. And Peter doesn't say he started to preach the wrong one. And put no difference between us and them, like, like you, my mid-Acts friends, do. You put a big difference between Jew and Gentile. On one hand, you say, well, there's no difference in the body of Christ between Jew and Gentile. But you got the biggest difference in the world between Jew and Israel and the Gentiles. And yes, I believe there's a difference, ethnically speaking, but I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about in God's eyes. Peter says he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. 
Well, if he put no difference and purified their hearts by faith, Peter knows that that's what he did to the Jews. Otherwise, the statement about no difference wouldn't mean anything. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Now, notice that. Because in his comment, David said that it was a yoke of bondage. Yeah, Peter agrees. See, you think Peter and James don't understand these things. They do. At least you think they don't later on. So they kind of backtracked. No, they understand these things. But we believe, we believe. Now, who's he talking to? It's a Gentile setting here. I mean, a Jewish setting here. But we believe. Now, we know what David will tell us about what they all believed. Peter believed and James believed you should keep the law of Moses and all that. But notice what he says. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Well, but there's no difference. They're saved. They're purified by faith. We are purified by faith. They are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. No hint of any kind of distinction in how God interacts with them, right? No distinction of gospels or messages or anything like that. Uh, and then James speaks. And, and I want to say this. James and the apostles and elders write this letter. Because the whole point of this convention here, if you will, is not to determine what the truth is. It had already been settled. God had already shown Paul. It had already shown Peter and the elders and the apostles in chapter 11. They already knew what the truth was on these issues. This isn't to decide it. This is to uh, make it clear for the group that still didn't understand. And the main reason this came together is because people were coming from James to like Antioch, the church at Antioch. This is, this is in relation to Galatians chapter 2. Now Galatians in chapter 2, Galatians was written before Acts 15. It's very clear for a multitude of reasons. Now I know David doesn't agree with that, and, I, and that's fine, but it, this makes much more sense. Besides the fact that in Galatians, all Paul had to do was whip out the letter or send them the letter. He had already been sending out the letter. He said, hey, read that letter from James and them to prove that they don't preach something different than I do or that they don't require you to preach or to uh, be Jews and become Jews. But he makes no reference to the letter. And in Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about how certain people, certain uh, people came from James. And then when they did, and Peter was already in Antioch, uh, Peter withdrew. Now, Peter didn't preach any different gospel or anything in Galatians 2. He was implying something by his isolation from the Gentiles. That's what the whole point is there in Galatians chapter 2. But notice that certain people came from James. Well, so these people are coming from James, and they're evidently telling them, these Gentiles, that, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm from Jerusalem. Let me tell you, we preach the law of Moses up there. So there was some misrepresentation. But it makes much more sense that these people would be coming from James before all this, and James saying in this letter what he says, no, we don't believe these things. And whoever these guys that were coming from James were not representing James faithfully. Because notice what is said. And they wrote letters by them, after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us, and this certainly could most likely also includes, besides the one mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, uh, no doubt part of this would be those who came from James mentioned in Galatians chapter 2. Now this won't make sense to... Uh, David, if he believes Galatians was written after this event, but I think it's quite clear that it isn't. But uh, he said, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So you know those men in Galatians uh, 2 that came from James didn't represent James. And the fact that they would be doing that after this, when this letter is circulating in the Gentiles, doesn't make much sense. 
It seems good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. And he goes on. Now, by the way, I'm just trying to pick my time here. He mentions certain things he wants them to do, and the point is still the same. They have... Jews everywhere, and even in the communities where they go, and there's certain things they have to pay special attention to if they don't want to cause unnecessary problems. But that's not even uh, something I want to get into here. But I want to respond to those comments. Uh, David doesn't understand Paul. He doesn't understand Peter. He doesn't give them the benefit of the doubt even. When they are saying, we don't believe these things, and here comes our mid-Acts friends saying, yeah, you know they believe that. And even, got, and even got Paul to do it in Acts 21. No, that's not the case. So once again, thanks for listening.